All right, well, we're there in Acts chapter number 1. And if you skip down to verse number 15, I just want to uh, show you a couple. I'm sorry, go to Acts 1. We're in Acts 6. Go to Acts 1 real quickly and look at verse 15. I, I want to show you just a couple things as we kind of get into the sermon tonight. And just a few things. The, the, when you get into the book of Acts, you learn about uh, primarily the church in Jerusalem and, and the first beginning chapters there. And this was a church that was growing. And I want to show you just a few places. If you look at uh, Acts 1.15, we begin the book with them running an average. They have about 120 people in their church. If you look at Acts 1.15, it says, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of the names together were about 120. So you see, we start Acts chapter 1, and they've got about 120 there in their church. If you go to Acts chapter 2, look, look at verse 41. Of course, you're familiar with the big uh, day of Pentecost that they had. Acts 2.41 says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So they had a huge uh, increase there. They got 3,000 people saved, baptized, added to their church. Skip down to verse 47. The Bible says, Praising God and having favor with all the people. And notice this, The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So every day they're adding people that, that the Lord brought to their church that should be saved. Go to Acts chapter 5. Look at verse 14. Acts chapter number 5 and verse 14. Acts 5, 14 says this, And the believers were the more added to the Lord multitudes both of men and women. If you go back to Acts chapter 6 where we started, look at verse 1. Acts chapter 6 and verse 1, the Bible says this, And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied. And what, what I'm trying to explain to you is that this church in Jerusalem, they're doing everything we talked about this morning. They're getting people saved. They're getting people baptized. They're beginning to disciple them. They're beginning them to, to help them grow and mature in their Christian life. And the, the church is growing. And as a result of the growth, whenever you, a church begins to grow, you're going to experience some growth pains, all right? If you look at verse 2 again there, notice what it says. It, uh, it says, uh, I'm sorry, verse 1, in those days when the number of disciples were multiplied, notice, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. Here's why, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So as a result of the growth, the, the, the life of the church has got so busy that things that used to get done were now being left undone. And people were murmuring, people were complaining, they're saying, well, this isn't happening and this isn't going on. And the leadership of the church, and at this time, the church here is being led by, by the 12 apostles and they're, they're kind of heading it up. But if you look at verse 2, the Bible says, Then the 12 called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Look at verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost, and wisdom who we may appoint over this business. And I want to teach you about the type of people that a, a growing church needs or the characteristics of the type of people that a growing church needs. Because just like this church in Jerusalem, the church he here in Arizona, Faithful Word Baptist Church, is growing. And that's exciting. I mean, I've been coming to, to, to Faithful Word and visiting since the, I think the first time we came was three, months. Three, two months. Okay, we were in the house. You know, I remember preaching in the house, and I remember uh, just, you know, the church being small. And every time we come back, you know, the church is growing, and the church is growing. And right now, the church is thriving and adding people every day, I'm sure, and adding people every week. And as the church grows, you know, you're going to have to realize that there are things that you, as church members, are going to have to do if the church is going to continue to grow. You know, when the church was, was running 10 people, Pastor Anderson and his wife could probably pretty much take care of everything that needed to be done. But as the church begins to grow, there's going to be things that are going to be left undone. People may start complaining and saying, well, why isn't this happening and why isn't this happening? And at some point, you're going to have to start asking and looking for people to kind of step up and take the leadership and begin to work. And I want to just show you just three characteristics of the men that they chose in this church to be able to help them to step up. Now, let me just give you a disclaimer because people like to watch, you know, sermons on the Internet and try to, like, pick apart everything you said, all right? So let me just go ahead and, and give a few disclaimers for those that like to do that. Number one, sometimes people like to say that Acts chapter 6 is only dealing with deacons. And they'll say, well, it only applies to deacons. It doesn't apply to anybody else. All right. First of all, the word deacon is not used in the passage. 
Now, I don't mind, you know, that people say it's deacons. It may be deacons. I don't know. You know, the word deacon just means servant, and it means minister. So it definitely applies, and I understand that they ordained them, and I get all that. But, you know, when you think about the qualifications of a deacon, or when you think about the qualifications of a pastor, you know, you read those qualifications of a pastor. It's interesting because Paul told Timothy, he said, Be thou an example, not to the believers, but he said, of the believers. And what you need to realize is like, you know, the pastoral qualifications, the deacon qualifications, whether this passage deals with deacons or not, it doesn't really matter because those qualifications, your job, it's not, God did not give Pastor Anderson qualifications to be a pastor so he could be an example to you. It's so that he can be an example of what you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be able to look at the pastor and say, that's what I'm supposed to be. It's the example of a believer. So even if this is about deacons, it still applies to all of us, and it's something that we should all strive uh, to be. So I just want to make that clear so, so you understand that. But the point is this. We can learn from this passage things that apply for us and things that people of a growing church are going to have to be. Number one, I just want you to see three points. We'll do it as quickly as we can tonight. Look at verse three. They, they said, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report. Notice this phrase, full of the Holy Holy Ghost. A church that is growing is going to need people that are spiritual. When they sought out for men to help this growing church, they said, we need people that are full of the Holy Ghost. Now, here's what's interesting. These guys were not necessarily going to stand up and preach on Sunday morning. They weren't going to necessarily stand up and preach on Sunday night. They weren't going to deliver the Wednesday night Bible study. They were going to help with just the ma daily ministration, the serving of tables, the things that you and I would think, well, you don't really need the power of God to be able to bring food to a widow. Okay, but they said if someone's going to step up in the church and if someone's going to be used in the church, they said we want to find people that are full of the Holy Ghost. Go to Galatians chapter number five. Galatians chapter number five. And, and let me and, and you need to understand this before we can get into anything practical. If, if you're coming to a church and the church is growing physically, numerically, but you're not growing you're not becoming a better Christian, a deeper Christian, you're not becoming more spiritual, then we're failing at our job. And see, what a growing church needs is members that are going to take the responsibility of their own spiritual life. Because in church, people like to come to church and just have the pastor spoon feed them. Just let the pastor teach them the Bible. I'm not going to read the Bible at home. I'm not going to pray for myself. I'm not going to do things on my own. I'm just going to let the church take care of it. But if the church is going to continue to grow, you as the members of this church are going to have to decide to take the responsibility to be the spiritual people that you need. And you know what's interesting about being spiritual is that it's not just a given. You have to work at it. You actually have to fight to be spiritual. Are you there in Galatians chapter 5? Look at verse 16. Galatians 5.16 says this, This I say then, walk in the Spirit. That's, how, that's what we're talking about when we're saying being spiritual, walking with God. Walk in the Spirit. Now notice, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But here's the problem, verse 17. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these two are contrary to the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. And here Paul is explaining to us that, look, you're not just going to become spiritual because you come to church. And by the way, you're not going to become spiritual because you come to a good church. And you're not going to become spiritual because your pastor's spiritual. And you're not going to become spiritual wife because your husband's spiritual. Or husband because your wife is spiritual. Or children because your parents are spiritual. There is a battle going on inside of you between the spirit, between the new man and the old man. The spirit and the flesh. They are lusting against each other. They are contrary against each other. It's a battle every day. And if you don't purpose to be a spiritual individual, to walk in the spirit, that you fulfill not the lust of the flesh, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. Notice verse 25, same chapter. Galatians 5.25 5 says this, If we live, now notice this, If we live in the spirit, now, if you're saved, the Holy Spirit has sealed you. You've got the Holy Spirit. But notice it says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. You know what that tells me? Is that you can live in the Spirit and not be walking in the Spirit. You can have the Spirit and not be walking 
fellowshipping with him on a regular daily basis. Now, you say, well, why, why does a growing church need spiritual people? Why does a growing church need people that are going to take responsibility for their own spiritual walk, that are going to take responsibility for making sure they walk in the... Why does that matter to a growing church? And here's why it matters, and here's what you need to understand. Go to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. The reason that a growing church must have people that are growing spiritually is because if the people aren't growing spiritually, the church will stop growing. There are people that were here at this camping trip last year that are not here today. And it's because they failed in the area of walking with God. We learn about this in the parable of the sower. Are you there in Matthew 13? There's a famous parable that Jesus taught. Now, I'm not going to go through all, the, all, all of the different grounds. You've got grounds being sown into, diff into, you know, seed being sown into different grounds. The seed is the Word of God, and the ground represents different types of people. I'm not going to talk about the first ground, which is the wayside, because that individual wasn't saved. And there are definitely people that aren't here that were here last year, and the reason they're not here is because they were never saved. All right. And then there's the fourth group. That's, of course, that's the fruitful ground. And we're not going to worry about you because you're already doing a good job. But look at verse five. OK, Matthew 13 and look at verse five. Here's here's why most church members don't make it. Here's why they quit. Here's why they you don't you know, you see them and then you don't see them anymore. And, and I would say that probably 90% of the people that quit on God who were actually saved fall into these categories. Matthew 13, verse 5, notice what Jesus said. He said, some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth. And forthwith, now note, the word forthwith means immediately or without delay. So the seed fell on stony places. There wasn't much earth. There wasn't a lot of deepness. And forthwith, here's what's interesting about this, you know, because there wasn't much earth, Jesus says, immediately, without delay, they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. Now, that kind of seems like a contradiction at first, because, you know, to us, we think like sprung up, that's a positive thing. I mean, just growing, isn't that a good thing? But here's what Jesus is teaching. And here's what happens in the life of a Christian. And by the way, this is what happens in the life of a church. When you cannot go deep, you go up. And when you spring up too fast, it just shows that you, there's no deepness there. This is why these charismatic, contemporary churches, you know, these guys go out and they start a church, and within like two weeks, they've got a thousand people. Yeah. And everybody looks at it and it's like, wow, the power of God. Look at what's going on there. But you know what? They spring up fast because there's no deepness there. Yeah. Yeah. They spring up fast because there's no root there. Right. And that, that's what happens with Christians. They show up and it's like, soul winning, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I want to do everything and praise the Lord for it. But let me tell you something. Don't spring up without going down. And don't get all excited and get, well, I'm going to just, you know, do everything I can. Because that's the individual. If there's a lot of outward activity and there's no Bible reading at home, if there's a lot of outward activity and there's no private prayer closet, if there's a lot of outward activity, but there's no walking with God, there's no meeting with God, there's no Bible memory. Look, you can impress everybody, but you're not going to last. Yeah. And the reason that growing churches begin to decline is because people quit being spiritual. Notice Jesus' commentary on it. Look at verse 20, Matthew 13, verse 20. He said, but he that receives seed. Now notice, these individuals were saved. They received the seed. Jesus told us earlier in the passage that the seed is the word of God. You don't have to turn there. Acts 2.41 says this, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. Why were they baptized? Because they got saved. And how did they get saved? Because they received the word. And the word is Jesus Christ. So if someone receives the word, they're saved. People like to say, oh no, the stony ground people, they were never saved. If they receive the word, they're saved. Amen. Now here's what's interesting though. Jesus says, but they that receive the word into stony places, notice, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon, the word anon means soon, with joy receiveth it. Look at verse 21 though. Yet he hath no root in himself. But... And here's the problem. And here's what we don't want for you. But doeth for a little while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by, this is why most people quit church, he is offended. In another passage in Luke, he tells us that in time of temptation, they fall away. And you know, if you don't make it in the Christian life, if, you, if you're one of these people that you kind of got in, you got excited, and then you disappeared. And it's like, where's brother so-and-so? Where's Scissor so and so? It may be because there's no private inward work. 
And God says, you know, the Bible teaches us, God wants us to walk in the Spirit. God, look, get excited, go to the camping trips, go to the activities, do everything else, but make sure you're not ignoring the inward work that needs to be done in your heart. Make sure you get rooted down in the Word of God. Make sure you're not just living in the Spirit, but you're walking in the Spirit. The second category is found, look at verse 7, Matthew 13, verse 7. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 7, Jesus says, And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung the up, and choke them. Jesus gives us, gives us the commentary for this in verse 22. Look what he says. Matthew 13, verse 22. He also that received the seed among the thorns is he that, notice, heareth the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. Now here's what's interesting. He, he heard the word, and he must have received it because he had the ability to be fruitful, but he became unfruitful. Why? Because the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. Go to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter number 4. In Mark chapter 4, we find the parallel passage to this parable. And you can find a, a little uh, different uh, description there. Mark chapter 4 and verse 18. Notice what it says. Mark 4 and verse 18 says this, And there are they, and these are they, which are sown among the thorns, such as hear the word, notice verse 19, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in. Notice what it says, Choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. And let me tell you something. The reason people don't make it, the reason people come to church and then they quit, and then you never see them again. You say, well, it's because they were never saved. They got saved. They heard the word. They might have got baptized. But let me tell you something. A Christian that's shallow and a Christian that's worldly is not helping a growing church. Because the only way to last the only way to be in this thing for the long run, the only way to be like Paul and, and be able to say when you end your life and say, I fought a good fight, I finished the course, I have kept the faith. The only way to get to that end line is to have a root down deep in your heart where you know God and you walk with God and you love God and you're walking in the Spirit and when you're not worldly. Because when you're too entangled in this world, go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, let me just show you this verse. 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse number 4. 2 Timothy chapter number 2 and verse 4. Notice, notice what Paul told Timothy. He said, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And you know, the problem that a lot of us have is we're just way too entangled into this world. And, and you need to understand this. And I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. And I like preaching at other churches because I don't know any of you. <laughs> but, you know, you've got to, you, you've, at some point, you know, people say to me all the time, like, well, I, li I like to go to church, but I'm just, not, I'm just too busy. Look, th you know, there may be nothing wrong with the soccer league that your kids are in. There may be nothing wrong with the bowling league that you're in. There may be nothing wrong with your hobbies. And your, but at some point, you're just going to have to figure out and you're just going to have to decide for yourself where your priorities lie. And you may have to just cut away some of these things. Some of these things from this world, you say, well, they're not bad things. But sometimes the affairs of this life will just choke the word to the point where you can't be fruitful. Where you can't produce and you can't be the guy and the lady that God wants to use in this church to help this church continue to grow. Because you're just way too involved in the things of this world. And when they sought out in the church at Jerusalem for people, that, and they said, these people are going to help us. They said, hey, let's find spiritual people. Let's find people that are filled with the Holy Ghost. Let's find people, they're not shallow. They're not worldly. They're not focused on all these outside things. They've made the Lord Jesus Christ their priority. Because you know what? People that make the Lord Jesus Christ their priority wake up in the morning and read their Bible. Pray. People that have made the Lord Jesus Christ their priority don't skip church to do worldly things. People that have made the Lord Jesus Christ a priority are going to last, and that's exactly what a growing church needs. So, a growing church, well, let, let me just ask you this, because I, I like to try to make these things as practical as possible, and answer, answer this question for yourself. How is your devotional life? How is your Bible reading? How is your prayer time? How has it been for the last month? You don't have to turn there, but 2 Corinthians 4.16 says this, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed. Notice, not at every camping trip. Not at every revival meeting. 
Not at every Sunday service. The inward man is renewed day by day, Amen. is what the Bible says. Amen. And you're going to have to take responsibility for that. You're going to have to develop the habit of Bible reading and prayer time and, and, and quitting some of the sin in your life so you can walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Go back to Acts chapter number 6. Look at verse 3. I said number 1, a growing church needs people that are spiritual. A growing church needs people that are spiritual. But number 2, I'd like you to notice this. A growing church needs people that are servants. A growing church needs people that are servants. Notice verse 3. It says, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Notice what this says. Whom we may appoint over this business. Now notice verse 4. This is the spiritual leadership of the church. They said, let us find people that we may appoint to this business. They said, this business is important business. These widows need to be taken care of. We need to make sure that this doesn't just go by the wayside, that it doesn't just, that it's not just left undone. But they said, let's find somebody that can take care of this business. Here's why. Look at verse 4. But we, this is the pastor, this is the spiritual leadership. He says, but they say, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. You say, what does a growing church need? See, when you first start a church, and you've got eight people coming. You can do everything as a pastor. As a pastor's wife, you can take care of everything. Everything's good. But guess what? With more people come more problems. We're the only people, you know, we're, as pastors, we're constantly praying, God, give us more people. God, give. And then he brings you people and they bring their problems with them. You know what I mean? But guess what? As the church begins to grow, the pastor gets busy ministering to people, talking to people, helping people, loving people. And, you know, there comes a point where church members need to step up and take care of business that your pastor and your pastor's wife just don't have to take care of. Yeah. Go to Exodus chapter 18. Let me show you an illustration of this. Exodus chapter 18. Exodus chapter number 18, we find the story of Moses, of course, one known passage, as he's leading the children of Israel. If you look at verse 13, Exodus chapter 18 and verse 13, the Bible says this, And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses. Notice what it says. From the morning unto the evening. That's, that's the average pastor right there. From the morning to the evening, they're just taking, you know, when the, when the church is small, you know, they're busy because they're working a full-time job and trying to pastor church. And then when the church gets bigger, they're just busy morning and evening dealing with people. And notice his father-in-law Jethro gives him some advice. Look at verse 14. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, What is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself? Now notice this word, alone. And all the people stand by thee from morning unto even. He's saying, Why are you doing this by yourself, Moses? This is way too much work for you. You need help, Moses. Now notice what he says, verse 15. And Moses said unto his father-in-law, Because the people come unto me and inquire of God. When they have a matter, they come unto me. And I judge between one and another. And I do make them know the statutes of God and his laws. Isn't that what the pastor does? Makes you know the statutes of God and his law. Verse 17. And Moses', Moses father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Now understand, what he was doing was good. How he was doing it was not good. And he said, This is not right, Moses. He says, the things that thou doest uh, is not good. Verse 18, thou wilt surely wear away. I read a statistic somewhere that, or I heard a statistic somewhere, that seven out of ten pastors don't make it in the ministry. And some of it is sin and some of it is laziness, but a lot of it is this. Where they just wear away because they're just trying to do too much. And eventually they get to the point where they just can't do it all. And they can't take care of it all. Now notice verse 17, the Bible says, And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Verse 18, Thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself. Here's the key word, alone. Here's what he's saying. There's only so much you can do, Moses. Look at verse 21. He said, here, here's, here's the answer. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of tens. Here's the point. At some point, the church gets to the place where the pastor, where his wife, where the people that were doing everything, they're just going to need some help. 
And look, I don't, Pastor Anderson did not asked me to preach the sermon. I don't, I'm not part of your church. I don't know. I, I don't know who does what. But let me tell you something. I know this. There are things that he does that he doesn't need to be doing. And there are things that he does and that maybe his wife does that somebody else could take care of. Now, you may think, well, well, you know, who does he think he is? But, but go back to Acts chapter 6. Look at verse 2. What I'm telling you is scriptural. Look at Acts chapter 6, verse 2. Notice what they said. They said, Then the twelve called the multitudes of the disciples unto them and said, Now notice what it says. They said, It is not reason. Here's what they're saying. There is no good reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Now here's what you need to understand. There are some things that only your pastor can do. He's the man of God. He stands up to preach the word. But let me tell you something. Serving food to widows, someone else can take care of that job. And I'm sure even in this church, and I know that there's people that serve here, and I'm not saying that, I'm sure there are tons of people that step up and do a lot of things. But I, I'm just here to tell you, a growing church is going to need individuals that are not only walking with God and filled with the Spirit, but that they're also going to step up and say, how can I help? What can I do? There are things that you could do to lessen the burden off of your pastor and your pastor's wife that would actually help the minister to grow. I mean, I, I, I don't know, but you don't, I don't, some people say like, well, I just don't know a lot of Bible and I just got saved. Do you really need to know a lot of Bible to fold a bulletin? I mean, honestly, do you need to have like an extensive Bible knowledge to fold an invitation? Do you need to have a lot of Bible knowledge to wash a van, to clean a building? Do you understand what I'm saying? These are important things that need to get done in ministry. But your pastor doesn't have to do them all. There are people that can step up and say, hey, I'll clean the building. It'd be great if two or three women say, hey, I'll clean it after Sunday church. I'll clean it after Wednesday church. I'll clean it before church or whatever. You know, it'd be great if, if, if men stepped up and said, hey, who, who changes the oil to that van, pastor? I'll take care of that for you. Who washes that van, pastor? I'll take care of that for you. See, at some point, people got to step up and say, hey, let me help. Some of you could step up and say, I'm going to show up 15 minutes early to church. I'm going to grab those bulletins and I'm going to make sure everybody gets a bulletin. I'm going to make sure everybody's greeted. I'm going to make sure everybody gets their handshake. And I'm going to smile. And I'm going to ask them what their name is. And I'm going to tell them, you know, and I'm going to talk to them. And I'm going to make them feel comfortable. Hey, it'd be great if, if a handful of you just said right now, that's going to be my ministry. I'm going to take that on. You never have to worry about that. I'll come in 15 minutes early. I'll stay 15 minutes late. I mean, who strains up the chairs at church? I don't, I don't know. I don't know who strains up the chairs at your church. I know this. Somebody else could do it. There are things that could be done. Now listen to me. This is a Baptist church. What that means is it's pastor-led. Don't show up to church next week and tell your pastor what you're going to do. All right? You're going to walk up to him. Pastor, I think you're a little overburdened. From now on, I'll preach Sunday nights. All right? No. That's not how it works. Okay? But you know what? It would be a great blessing to your pastor and your pastor's wife if somebody walked up to them and said, Is there something I can do to help lessen your load? Is there something I could take on? And then be consistent with it. Then be serious with it. Don't be this type of person that says, hey, I'm going to do that. And then you do it for two weeks and then we never see you again. Take responsibility to walk with God. But take responsibility to serve. You can help greet people. You can help just, I, I don't know, I, I don't know what you guys do, but I mean, just find somewhere to serve. And by the way, every Christian needs to be a serving Christian. Everybody needs to do something. Go back to Acts chapter 6. We said, number one, a growing church needs people that are spiritual. And I said, number two, a growing church needs people that are servants. But number three, a growing church needs people that are soul winners. And we talked about that this morning. We talk about it a lot, but it's, it's the most important thing. Look at verse, are you there in Acts chapter 6? Look at verse 7. Notice what the Bible says about this church. And the word of God increased. And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Go to Acts chapter 5, just one chapter over. Acts chapter 5, look at verse 42. Acts chapter 5 and verse 42. Acts chapter 5, verse 42. And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Look at Acts chapter 20, verse 20, often called Acts 20, 20 vision. Acts chapter 20 and verse 20 says this, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I've showed you and I've taught you publicly from house to house. I just, I, I just want to talk for a moment. And again, I don't, I'm not part of your church. I don't know your church. I don't know some of you. I mean, I know a, a lot of your faces. Some of you, I don't know, even know your names. And I'm sorry. 
But I want to talk to you to those of you that aren't soul winners at Faith Forward Baptist Church. And like I said, I don't know who is or who isn't. But I, I, I don't know if you figure it out. But soul winning is like the number one, the number two, the number three, the number four, the number five, and probably the number six most important thing in this church. I mean, this is what this church is about. Soul winning. Getting people saved. Getting people baptized. Amen. Getting people discipled. And you know, at some point, you're just going to have to realize, you say, well, I love this church. I want to be a part of this church. If you want to be a part of this church, why don't you be a part of the most important part of this church, which is getting people saved? Amen. Because a growing church doesn't, you don't need, just need spiritual people. You don't need, just need people that say, hey, I want to lend a hand. But you need people that say, I want to lend a hand in soul winning. I want to be somebody that's going to help reach the next generation and reach the next, uh, you know, a convert. I want to be involved in this thing. And maybe you don't know a lot. And maybe you don't understand a lot. Just get involved. Just say, I want to learn. Because a growing church needs people that are going to go soul winning. And, and I want to explain something to you, too. Because people get this idea. They, here's, here's what most people think. They think, if I go soul winning, then I don't have to serve. Because I want soul winning. Like, I don't, I don't have to help clean, you know, pick up the trash. Because I'm a soul winner. Let the non-soul winners do that. And then some people get this idea, like, I serve. I clean the building. So I don't have to go soul winning. My brother-in-law, uh, recently, he, he gave me an illustration I thought it was pretty good. He, he said to me, a church is like a firehouse. If you were to go to a firehouse, you know, on a little homeschool uh, field trip or something, and you go check out a firehouse, you know, you'd walk in and you know what you'd see? You would see some firemen that are washing the truck. And you'd see some guys just mopping the floors. And you'd see some guys, you know, making food. And you'd see some guys, you know, in the gym working out. And when the bell goes off and it's time to fight a fire, guess what? They all get on the truck and they all go fight the fire. That's good. And that's how a church should be. Amen. You say, well, I'm a, I'm a soul winner. I go out and I pull people out of the fire, hating the garment, even spotted by a flesh. Okay, but when you get back to the firehouse, can you help us clean a little bit? I mean, think about a firefighter who, like, never fights a fire. He, 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 he's in the firehouse, he's got the uniform on, he's making the eggs for breakfast, the fire alarm goes off. Oh, I'm kind of shy. That's not really for me. <laughs> I'm new at this firefighting thing. I mean, that's not my... You're here. Guess what? You're not a firefighter. But on the, same, on the same line, think of the firefighter who said, who, you know, his chief comes up and he's like, hey, I need, I need somebody to clean out the truck. No, no, you don't understand. All I do is fight fires. I'm, you want me to do what? You want me to go pick up what? No, no, I, I'm a firefighter. All I do is fight fires. You know, people are going to look at that guy and be like, what's your problem? You know, and in the church, you need to be doing both. Serving and soul winning. Fighting fires and helping at the firehouse. Now listen to me. I'm not telling you need to take on some huge responsibility that's going to, you know, take up all of your time. But you can just pick one job and say, hey, is there something I can do? Is there something I can take care of? This is going to be my ministry. I'm going to take care of it. It, it. it could be, I don't know what it could be. It could be cleaning, whatever it is. But you can say, I want to help. This will be me. I'll take on this job. And pastor, you never have to worry about it. It'll always be done. And by the way, I'll show up for soul winning too. That's what a growing church needs. A growing church needs individuals that are spirit-filled, that have a servant's heart, and that have a heart for souls. So here's my question for you. How's your walk with God? How's your devotional life? Are you walking with the Spirit? Here's the interesting thing about walking with the Spirit is we can't tell. It's easy to fake it. But you may have to just make a few decisions and say, man, I love this church, I love the Bible, but maybe you need to start making the Bible a priority in your life. Maybe you're here and you're like, hey, I'm doing pretty good with my spirituality. I feel like I'm growing a lot. I feel like I'm learning a lot. Maybe it's time for you to step up and say, how can I help, Pastor? What can I do? Is there something I can do to lessen your load? Hey, li listen, Mrs. Anderson, is there something I can do to lessen the load? that you? I know you've got to deal with people. I know you've got to deal with problems. But is there something that you take care of on a weekly basis that I could take care of? And I'll do a good job with it. And I'll be consistent with it. And I won't let you down. I promise. And then you do it. And then everybody needs to just be involved in the ministry of soul winning. This is what a growing church needs. This is what Faithful Word needs. I'm so excited for Faithful Word. I'm so excited every time I come, I see these crowds, and every time I talk to Pastor Anderson on the phone, he's like, man, we had 127, or we had 120, we had 110. This is exciting, but at the same time, with the excitement of growth, it's time for some to step up and say, I'm going to take part of this soul winning thing, and I'm going to take part of this serving thing, and I'm going to start taking a little responsibility for my spirit 
Because this is what a growing church needs. Spiritual people, serving people, soul winning people. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Thank you for this church. Father, I pray that you'd use this sermon in the hearts of these individuals. Lord, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I really don't know who does what at Faith Forward Baptist Church. I don't know who shows up soul winning. I don't know who cleans the buildings. I don't know who folds the invitations. I don't know how this sermon would be taken by any individual. But Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just spread it around as it needs to be spread and that there'd be people that would make choices today to begin to step up and help this church as it continues to grow. Thank you for Faith Forward Baptist Church. Thank you for the example it is to me. Thank you for these dear people. Thank you for Pastor Anderson and Mrs. Anderson and the sacrifices that they've made to, 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 to be here and to provide this. Help us to be reminded that none of this could happen without the sacrifice that you did on the cross for our sins. And help us, Lord, to be willing to go out and spread that news with other people and to serve as a result of our love for you. We love you, Lord, in your precious name I pray. Amen.